Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, along with the hired men, and went and followed him. I don't usually give titles to my sermons, but this one has a title. The title of this morning's sermon is Disciples Don't Just Happen. I can remember as a little child reading this passage or having classes uh, and my Bible class teacher would talk about this passage and the emphasis was on blind faith. All right? Here's Peter and Andrew, James and John. They don't know Jesus. Jesus just shows up, calls to them. They leave everything and follow Jesus and that's kind of the end of the story. But Mark doesn't always give us as many details as we might like to have. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time introducing you to how Peter, Andrew, James, and John got introduced to Jesus. And then at the end, maybe draw some parallels that can be used in our own walk with Jesus. So probably the first meeting that James and John had with Jesus was not on this occasion, but probably, perhaps even in their youth. You have to do some biblical calisthenics to get there, but it seems very likely that Mary had a sister named Salome and that Salome was the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were his cousins. So probably had met them at some time growing up. Now add that to John the Baptist who also would have known Jesus growing up, another relative of Jesus, who did not in their growing up years have any idea who Jesus was. There was no sense when Jesus was 15 or 18 or 20 or 25 that if you had showed up for a big family reunion that everybody would have been sitting around the tables talking about his mission that was upcoming or that he was Messiah or that he was going to be crucified for the world. They didn't know any of that, but they knew Jesus. They knew the person. They knew the individual Jesus growing up. But the Gospels don't give us much mention of Jesus' family history. You just have to kind of put the pieces together. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go to Matthew, Mark, and John in particular and look at the list of the women who were around the cross at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And if you kind of say, well, okay, this one matches this one, and this one matches this one. There is the mother of James and John who is there with her. And in the other uh, gospel, she's called Salome. So uh, it's at least possible, maybe even probable, that James and John knew who Jesus was uh, early on in his life. But I want us to go over to John chapter 1, verse 35. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. And notice a little bit about how Jesus comes into contact early on with this group of four guys. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, there's the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and said, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, 
was one of the two who heard that John had said and who had followed Jesus. So the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and for we English-speaking folks, the anointed one. We found the king. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So all of a sudden you go from being a follower of John the Baptist to meeting the one that John's been telling you about all this time. Look, there's the Lamb of God. You get to spend the afternoon with him. And as soon as you find out who he really is, you go back and get your brother and bring him to Jesus. Right? This is prior to Jesus calling them on the beach, leave your nets and come be fishers of men. And so we know at least that Peter and Andrew have met Jesus. They've been introduced to Jesus prior to this event that Mark records for us on the beach. Now go over to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. This is another one of those stories that I remember from Bible class growing up. How many of you grew up going to Bible class? Vacation Bible schools, right? We, those, those stories, right? They, they get in there and they stay in there. Whether it's the way that you do the handwork, you know, you, you remember coloring the pages and, and making handwork to take home with you. And a lot of time that handwork ends up on the refrigerator or maybe in a drawer somewhere, or maybe just in the corner of your room has to be cleaned up when you clean your room one of those days. But those things make us remember those stories. And so a lot of us have a bunch of stories from Bible class all kind of lined up in there somewhere, but we don't always get them put together. Right? So Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, is another encounter that Jesus has with these guys. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's also known as the Sea of Galilee, uh, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He, sa he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little bit from shore. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. I've always wanted to try that, by the way. When, when you're on the lake... You have to whisper, don't you? Everybody know your business. If that, that boat way over there, they can hear what you're saying because it just kind of skips along the water like a rock. It goes over to the other people. But Jesus sits down in the boat and is speaking to the people on the shore. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a great number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. So Mark says Jesus was going along the shoreline, and he called Peter and Andrew, James and John. And they all left their nets and followed him. Luke gives us a little bit more of the background of the story. Prior to calling them to follow him, he had been doing some preaching. So not only had they met him, at least Peter and Andrew had met him through John the Baptist. They had heard him do some preaching, so they knew a little bit about his spiritual mission. And when it was time for them to come and follow him, they knew enough about him to make a decision, and they decided that they would follow him. Now, if they had met him previously through Peter and Andrew, that might explain how easy it was for Jesus to make inroads with James and John. Since Peter had already met him through John the Baptist and through Andrew, his brother, it explains why it was so easy for Jesus to say, would you please let me sit in your boat and preach? Cast out a little bit from the shoreline. Give me a pulpit to preach in. So all of those things, Luke lets us know, and it, it's a little bit easier for us to understand why these guys decide to follow Jesus. So that brings us to the, to the question. 
right? If disciples don't just happen, then how do people become disciples? Right? And I've got four things here that I think maybe you and I can grab hold of and make use of. Number one is that these guys uh, knew someone that was a follower. Someone that they trusted was already a disciple. Now, if you take uh, Peter and Andrew, you've got John the Baptist. So John is talking to two of his disciples. When you think about John, how many people do you think about being in attendance? I think about multitudes, right? John was preaching in all of Jerusalem, Judea, and the surrounding area were going out to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. He had bunches of folks that were coming out. But in that particular passage in John, it says that John the Baptist was there with two. We don't get the name of the other one. But we know that one of them was Andrew. So we've got a guy that is giving personal time and attention to Andrew. Right? He's not just one of those folks that came to get baptized. Andrew is talking to John personally. And as Jesus passes by, John says to Andrew and the other individual who was there, that guy right there, that's the one you're looking for. That guy right there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so Andrew and the other guy go find Jesus, spend the rest of the day with him, and they get to know Jesus. So a lot of times what happens in people becoming disciples is that they know someone, they trust someone, who already believes in Jesus. So that gives us a challenge. Number one, be trustworthy. <laughs> if, if, uh, if your lifestyle and your demeanor are such that people can't trust you and don't like you very much, then your chances of being able to disciple other people and bring them to Jesus is pretty low. Right? So lifestyle counts. If I'm going to live a life that's very worldly, it's going to be difficult for the people of the world to then follow me to Jesus. If they're surprised when I tell them that I'm a Christian, we may have a problem already. But they knew somebody that they trusted, and that somebody that they trusted was a follower of Jesus. Number two, that someone was very verbal about their faith. People need to know what we believe. And you've got two examples here, just back to back, and it's kind of a, a pyramid effect. You've got John the Baptist who says to Andrew, look, there goes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Andrew goes and gets with Jesus, and Jesus says, come spend the afternoon with me. So not only, here, if you want to have somebody to be envious of, Andrew. He spent the morning hanging out with John the Baptist, and he spent the afternoon hanging out with Jesus. Right? If anybody can match that one, just let me know. That's a pretty good deal. So he spends the morning with John the Baptist. He spends the afternoon with Jesus because John the Baptist is vocal about it. That's the guy you're looking for. Go follow him. And then Andrew immediately goes and finds his brother Peter. And he says to Peter, I found who we're looking for. I found the Messiah. I found the Christ. I found the anointed one. So you should come with me to go find him. So if we are trustworthy, step one, and vocal, step two, we might have a shot at bringing people to the Savior. If we are willing to speak out loud about it. Now, I won't make you raise your hand, but how many of us have a problem with that? It's not the easiest thing to do in our culture for a couple of reasons. Uh, on, the, on the good side, there are so many people that already believe. We don't want to seem redundant. Let me talk to you about Jesus. And they're like, well, I've gone to church all my life. Right? It, it seems like we're, we're trying to put something in that's already there, or at least that they think is already there. And then on the other extreme, there's this fear of rejection that people will look at us like we've lost it because we believe in Jesus. There are people on our planet, there are people in our neighborhood who cannot understand why we're so adamant in our worship, why we're so regular in our attendance, why we're so willing to sing songs of praise and take the Lord's Supper every week. Why you guys would sit there for half an hour and listen to me talk 
about Jesus. They don't get that. It's very foreign to them. And so sometimes we're a little afraid to try to interject Jesus into that mindset because we know that it's going to be rejected, that they're not going to readily accept the things that we have to say. Always makes me think about poor Samuel. You know, Samuel lived his life trying to serve the Lord. And then the people said, what we really want is a king. And God said, Samuel, don't worry about it, man. It's not you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And our culture often rejects our Heavenly Father, even if we're bold enough to speak out about our faith. Number three, the disciples usually buy in if they have an opportunity to render service. You know, this is something I think that the church misses sometimes. We as, as ambassadors of the, of the Lord sometimes miss. People are not looking for an opportunity to just come watch us be faithful. They want to be part of what's going on. So if we present salvation to them, in such a way that, that all that they get out of it is, okay, now you're saved, so you know, be quiet and everybody else is doing their thing. Right? So if, if we are trying to bring somebody to be a disciple, we need to give them a reason to be a disciple, a lifestyle, a, 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 an opportunity to serve in the Lord's kingdom. People that are most active in the church are most likely to continue being active in the church. People who are least active in the church are most likely to fall away. Why is that? Well, it's somebody else's circus. It's somebody else's thing, right? I'm watching you do your faith. But when it becomes my faith, that changes everything. So Andrew goes and gets Peter. And when Peter comes and begins to follow Jesus... Andrew never ever gets called just Andrew anymore. Read the scriptures. It always says Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Right? Simon Peter gets to go with James and John and be part of the transfiguration moment. He gets to watch the little girl raised from the dead. Uh, he, on the night of the when Jesus is arrested, he leaves eight disciples, right? Judas is already gone. He leaves eight of the apostles in one place. He takes Peter, James, and John. He says, you guys come over here with me. We're going to pray over in this area. Drops them off, goes a little farther, prays by himself. If you're Peter, you're connected. You have a reason to be a disciple. Now, challenge to all of us who already are, if we don't know what that reason is, Maybe we need to be searching for our place of service in the body. And then finally, the realization that Jesus is actually calling them to a different lifestyle. It's not me who I've always been now being part of the church. It's not me who I've always been and all the things I've done kind of adding one more thing that I do. It's a different lifestyle. Jesus says to these four guys, I want you to leave your father's nets. I want you to leave your means of uh, income. I want you to leave everything you've known all of your life and come follow me because now you're going to be fishers of men. Right? I'm changing your identity, not just your activities, but your identity has to change. You have to look at yourself in a different way. You're no longer fishermen who also preach. Now you're just disciples who are going to go into the world and change the world on my behalf. So, like I said, disciples don't just happen. It's not something that just suddenly falls out of the sky, but people are involved in bringing other people to learn about Jesus and getting them connected so that they too can be servants in the kingdom. It happened for Peter and Andrew. It happened for James and John. It happened for the rest of those apostles. There was a reason. There was some connection behind those things. And it happens for you and me too. Take just a moment. I'll wait on you. Think about the people that are the reason you are where you are today. People that loved you enough to talk to you and say, look, I found the Messiah 
And I want you to find the Messiah too. You got them? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for all these people. People both living and dead. People who loved us so much that they wanted to make sure that we got to know you. We praise you for our ministers, for our Bible class teachers, for our moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and great grandmas and great grandpas, for neighbors and friends who wanted us to be disciples of yours. Father, we pray that you would give us that kind of desire that the people around us would come to know Jesus and come to find salvation in his blood. It's in him that we pray. Amen.